thank you for organising this, and thank you, Evan Tan, for doing all the technology in the background. Uh, as Angelina said, my name is John Powell, um, and I'm a scientist and a musician. And uh, I wrote one book on the technical aspects of uh, the physics of uh, music, and uh, which is how music works, and another one on more psychological um, effects of music called Why We Love Music. And those will form the basis of my talk today. I'll be concentrating on the psychology end of music because it makes a better talk, really. The, the, other, books, uh, the other books on the science of music and uh, psychology of music are usually very complicated because they're written for professionals. So I decided to write a couple of books which were in sort of chatty, amusing English to explain the situation to everybody. And uh, they've gone down very well. Uh, and I'd like to begin uh, by looking at what we're going to be talking about today. We'll start with music as medicine, music therapy and so on. And then we'll go into about music and thinking, things like the Mozart effect, whether it affects your, whether music can affect your intelligence. And then we'll move on to the effects of music on your, the background music on your behavior. Uh, then where scales come from and why octaves are so special, because octaves are really central to all musical systems. Finally, we'll have a look at why music exists at all. There must be a Darwinian re reason why music exists, because it's everywhere and it's been around for a very long time. And uh, I've got some ideas on that as well. So we'll make a start here with <clears throat> music as medicine. Now, music, music therapies began uh, with concerts for injured World War II American soldiers in hospital. <clears throat> uh, and what they, what they wanted to do was just cheer the soldiers up. Uh, but they found that concerts made the soldiers heal quicker and feel better and they were very surprised by this and they started to train music therapists in 1944 to see if they could make a big difference to actual clinical problems for people and now controlled clinical trials have shown that music can be used to treat depression stress pain strokes high blood pressure parkinson's disease <clears throat> insomnia and other, many other human maladies um, so let's have a look at how this works, because it really does work. This has been proved scientifically on many occasions that these things actually do work. It's not just hippie hand waving that music's good and nice for you. They actually have clinical results. So here we are. Here's a young person having a lot of trouble with a horse in his car. <laughs> Obviously, they're experiencing a lot of stress. And stress is related to having too much adrenaline and cortisol in your system and not enough serotonin and dopamine. Now, the good news is that music can control your inner pharmacy. Uh, inside your body, you can generate lots of drugs, basically chemicals, which help you in various situations. Uh, have a look at which ones do what. Here are some of the main ones. Uh, adrenaline gives you energy, cortisol gives you more energy. Uh, and if, if you're attacked or you're frightened, uh, you flood your system with adrenaline and cortisol. The uh, the the uh, adrenaline floods your uh, blood to your arms and legs and increases your blood sugar and opens your airway so you breathe more. So it makes you into a more efficient machine. Cortisol also gives you energy, but it also tells your body to ignore any damage. So what you do is you run away or fight uh, in the fight and flight response. Uh, and these chemicals are making that happen. There are other more pleasurable uh, chemicals you generate. Serotonin is a reward system. We need rewards, but we need to be rewarded when we eat, for example. And so if you, someone gives you a sandwich, you release serotonin to your system. Uh, and lots of other pleasurable activities generate serotonin. Dopamine gives you pleasure and focus. Uh, noradrenaline uh, makes you vigilant, which is obviously very important from a Darwinian point of view. And oxytocin, uh, makes you bond with other people, which is also Darwinianly very important because, you know, bonding makes you live longer, makes your genes go on. So uh, oxytocin is generated in your system, for example, during sex or when you're breastfeeding. So these are all very important chemicals which you generate inside our own bodies. And music can actually moderate what levels of these chemicals you have in your system. So for stress and depression, uh, music's very useful. Now, you might think this is just, yeah, music's good for you, but really it's very important. Uh, a psychologist called Susan Hanser got
got 30 depressed elderly patients together. She gave 10 of them personal training at home about music to movement, movement to music and relaxation to music. And they chose their own music. So they had a full course of how to get on with music, how it would re reduce, reduce their stress levels. Another 10 patients had just written instructions and suggestions to them for what music to use. And 10 other patients had nothing. They just had general therapy. After eight weeks, groups one and two, the ones with the music uh, movement and relaxation, were no longer clinically depressed and the effects were very long lasting. So that's only in eight weeks, using music intelligently uh, actually reduced their depression until they were no longer depressed at all. Well, they weren't clinically depressed anymore because you can test how deep someone's depression is. And they, they used biofeedback devices, which uh, can check your blood pressure and your heart rate. And they saw that all these medical uh, measurements were actually uh, improving just by listening to music. Now, the one that impresses me the most, I think, is music and sleep, because if you've got insomnia, it increases your stress levels. Uh, so you get this negative cycle of insomnia, stress, stress, you can't sleep and so on. And this is your, your lack of ability to sleep is uh, linked to how much noradrenaline you have in your system. Basically, you're trying to get to sleep, but you're too vigilant. Uh, and happily, once again, music can reduce the amount of noradrenaline in, in your system. They can actually take blood tests and see it dropping if you listen to the right sort of music. In this case, uh, 94 students between the ages of 19 and 28 were given a 45 minute tape of classical music. None of them were good sleepers. They were all really bad sleepers. They, they had, you know, um, insomnia. So within, within three weeks, 90% of them were sleeping perfectly well. And that reduced their stress levels, which reduced their depression and so on. So it's very effective. Um, if you're older, they did another group of people who were between 60 and 83 years old. Only half of them became good sleepers after about three weeks, but it's still a great improvement. The average adult takes about between 13 and 35 minutes to fall asleep. So what you need to do if you're having trouble sleeping, and I know, you know these times can be very stressful and also doing a PhD can be very stressful, I know that because I did one myself, um, then make a playlist of gentle classical music that lasts for about 45 minutes to an hour and just play it to yourself quietly as you get into bed and you'll find that your, uh, your ability to sleep really improves. Your insomnia goes away and your stress levels will drop. It's a very useful thing to do. If you want any hints on what music to use, there are plen plenty of you know, classical adagio type or relaxing classical music um, uh, CDs and playlists out there. But I do find that many of them have got lumps in them, which sort of wake you up. I use uh, uh, lute music, uh, because lute music has a very limited dynamic range. Uh, it's very beautiful, uh, and but it, does, it never gets uh, scary or dramatic. It's always very pleasant to listen to. So basically, if you get any CD or playlist that involves a lot of lute music, then you'll probably find it helps you sleep. Moving on to pain. Now, this is also very interesting um, because pain isn't a thing. You can't measure it. If you stub your toe on a quiet Sunday morning when you're going to make yourself a cup of tea, it will hurt a lot and you'll probably do a lot of swearing and it'll be very painful. But if you do exactly the same impact on your toe when you're running to save a child's life, uh, then because they're, they're running into the street, you won't notice it at all. So pain is not a set thing. It's just a perception. And because it's a perception, it can, your response to it can be altered by lots of things, uh, including music. Uh, they did some really interesting tests, the psychologists, uh, in dental um, clinics. Obviously, dentistry is very painful and, uh, well, it can be, uh, and it's very frightening. And so, and you're very, you haven't got any power when you're in a dentist chair. So what they did was they had the patients choosing the music that was played, and they also gave them control of the volume of the music. If you had control of the volume and the choice of the music, it empowers you and relaxes you and distracts you from the pain. So they did find that people, uh, they, the level of pain they perceived, don't forget it's not actually a thing, it's just a perception, dropped dramatically if they uh, had control of the music. So moving on to the next thing, 
music and thinking. Now, <clears throat> uh, from what I hear, you're all scientists, and uh, you should be very interested in whether music will help you think. And there's also this uh, story that music and maths are, are related. So we'll come to that in a second or two. First of all, I want to talk about the Mozart effect, which you may have heard of. The Mozart effect um, was discovered by Frances Rauscher in 1993. Uh, she published a paper in Nature. And she, was, she basically had three groups of people. Uh, one group listened to a piece of Mozart, uh, the others listened to relaxation instructions, and the other group listened to just silence. And then they did an IQ test, which I'll show you in a second. And they found that the ones that listened to the Mozart got an increase of eight or nine points in their IQ. This led to lots of very strange things happening. It, it became all over the newspapers. It was a very popular piece of science. And for example, in Florida, they passed a law that daycare centers should play classical music. And they were also pl playing classical, there was cl classical symphonies in Texas prisons. So all this stuff happened because people thought Mozart was the key to increasing your intelligence. So this is the test that the people had to do um, after listening to, so they had three groups, one listening to Mozart piano pieces, one listening to relaxation instructions, one just sitting in silence. And they did that for 10 minutes and then they were told to do this test. And what you do is you fold the paper and then you cut that corner off and then you have to guess which, which one, not guess, you have to work out which one it is that, that when you unfold it. And the people scored best, the ones that listened to the Mozart. And by the way, I can tell you that the answer is B. This led to a lot of funding for psychology research into the Mozart effect. And they did lots of work on it and they found there was a Schubert effect, exactly the same. There was a Blur effect, exactly the same. There was a Stephen King effect, because if you listen to Stephen King's short story, you got exactly the same result. People got slightly more intelligent if they did, if they listened to any of those three things before doing a, an IQ test. So they thought, well, it's not Mozart, is it? Mozart completely wrong. It's basically anything that puts you into a positive fra frame of mind and slightly stimulates you, makes you perform better on an IQ test. So if you're relaxed and stimulated as you go into the test, you will get better points. So uh, this is obvious if you think about it, because if, if you're too, if you're feeling very dopey or you're very panicky, then you won't perform well in any test. So uh, the music generates some dopamine in our system and some arousal, some norepinephrine. They also found out, that after thinking about it for a while, they thought there should be some music around which would not give you a Mozart effect. And so they've tried playing the Albedonia Adagio and that didn't give you a Mozart effect because it's a very slow piece of music. Uh, and it's, it's, it's rather, it makes you sleepy a bit more than anything else. So it doesn't stimulate you. It's pleasant, but it doesn't stimulate you. And therefore you don't go into the test all relaxed and ready to go. Now, this is a very common statement. People think that math skills and musical skills are related. Uh, but um, so, so American psychologists have looked into this to find out whether it was true or not. And uh, guess what? It's not true. They surveyed 7,000 teenagers in 2009 and found no correlation between musical training and mathematical skill. And in 2011, they surveyed hundreds and hundreds of adult members of the American Mathematical Association and the Modern Languages Association and found both groups to be equally musical. So although lots of musicians do maths and lots of mathematicians do music, there is no correlation between the two. Now, background music is quite interesting. I'm sure many of you play background music when you're uh, working, when you're writing papers or um, doing your PhD. And I would advise you to read a book by Daniel Kahneman called Thinking Fast and Slow. It's a very excellent book about how we think. And it does say quite clearly in that book that you work best in silence. And that's true. You concentrate best in silence. You're not, if you think about your brain as a computer, you're not using any of your computing power to deal with the music. So your brain's completely concentrating on what you're doing, what you're writing. 
This was found to be true with, with surgeons who are concentrating very hard, then work best in silence. Uh, if you play music to them, it distracts them, uses part of their brain capacity, which is obviously a bad thing, particularly if you're the patient. There is one case where music does help you concentrate, and that if it's if it's if the music is drowning out other more distracting noise. So if you're working in a bar, and I know many of you do, um, then you'll find that having earphones on playing music to cut out the, re the rest of the noise of the bar will help you concentrate and will help your productivity. But in general, you'll find you do your best work fastest if you're working in silence. So more, more background music. Background music in shops. Do you like it? Do you think it affects your behavior? Many of you will say, I don't like it, and it doesn't have any effect on my behavior. And I'm, I'm sorry, but you're wrong. It's amazing the, the difference it makes to your behavior. Uh, this has been tested in this environment. This is probably the most impressive psychological test I read about when I was writing the second book on psychology. Um, here we have the, the end of aisle display of wine. A couple of psychologists from the UK, Adrian North and David Hargreaves, took a display like this and they put a small speaker on top uh, and they played music very quietly through it. You would barely notice it, but it was quite quietly. And on the shelves below the speaker, they put German wine and French wine. German wine on the left, French wine on the right, on each shelf. And they had the expensive stuff at the bottom and the cheap wine towards the top. Now, when they didn't play anything at all through the, through the speaker, uh, they sold more French wine. Now, what they did, they didn't, they, they weren't in the room, they put the speaker there and they just checked, they say that the checkouts and see what people came out with. So they were nowhere near what was actually happening. So all they had to do was interview people as they came out, found out how much wine they'd, they'd, uh, they'd, uh, they'd uh, bought. So if there was silence, more French wine than German wine was sold. And this was in the UK and that's generally the pattern. If they played German Bavarian umpar music very quietly through the speaker, they sold twice as much German wine as French wine, which is a very un unusual result. And if they played Parisian cafe music through this little speaker, they sold five times as much French wine, five times as much. That's an order of magnitude difference, just changing the music from German umpar music to French Parisian cafe music. And they interviewed people as they came out of the shop and said, do you think the music you, you heard when you were buying the wine changed your mind about what to buy? And most of the people that were interviewed in this way said, what music? There wasn't any music playing. So a very interesting result. They then tried playing classical music. And this had the strange effect of making people feel more sophisticated and posh. And so those, those people bought more expensive wine. So, and that was quite a clear thing as well. So, a very interesting experiment. I'm sure they're very pleased with themselves. Another really weird thing about music and wine is that you can change the taste of wine with the music you're listening to. In the case of these experiments, the psychologists got people together and they had a wine tasting. They didn't tell the people in the wine tasting that there was going to be uh, anything to do with music. They just played music in the background like you, you do at many events. So all these people got together came to this wine evening and they were asked to mark how complicated and heavy the wine was or how it was zingy and refreshing or mellow and soft and they were doing this they gave them five different glasses of wine and said you know can you just rate them please they changed the music uh, and the music started off with something like very light like uh, Claire de Lune by Debussy and then by the end of the uh, tasting they were playing the Ride of the Valkyries uh, so very, uh, and Carmina Burana, very heavy, complex music. Uh, and in the middle, they played zingy pop music. And they asked people, they give them the words, they use words like zingy, refreshing, uh, heavy, complex, and that sort of thing. And what happened was the people identified the wine taste as being what the music was. So if the music was uh, zingy, refreshing music, they wrote, this wine is zingy and refreshing. If the music was heavy and complex, they were, this is powerful and heavy, this wine. The thing was that all the wine was the same. They didn't give them five different wines. They gave them five glasses of wine, all of which were from the same bottle. 
And so people just changed their opinion of the taste of the wine, depending on what was being played to them music wise. Moving on to background music in restaurants. Once again, there are very big uh, changes you can make to people's behavior. If you play slow music in a restaurant, uh, the people who are eating there, they take fewer bites per minute. So they eat more slowly, but they spend 50% more on drinks. And if you play them classical music that's slow, they, they feel posh and sophisticated again so that they also buy more expensive wine. And uh, so the most important thing, if you ever own a restaurant, any of you, is the most important thing is not to let the staff choose the music because the staff are generally younger and they choose music they like and they turn the volume up because they're enjoying it because it's helping them in their day. And the diners will then be exposed to fast modern music they're not particularly familiar with because they're usually in their you know, 30s, 40s and 50s and they're listening to all the music being played by these 20 odd year olds. But if you play appropriate background music, you get about 10% more sales in your restaurant. And uh, so if you have a posh restaurant for older people, you want to play slow music because they, they eat more slowly, they eat, they eat more and they drink more. If you've got a trendy young person's restaurant, then you want the fast music because the people eat faster and they leave quicker. So you turn the tables around more often. So uh, that's uh, how to run a restaurant. Here we have trouble with teenagers. These are teenagers, and as you can see, they're trouble. Well, they're not really, are they? Um, but the, the, the City Council of Sydney in 2006 had a lot of trouble with teenagers in the shopping malls. The teenagers weren't doing anything wrong. The teenagers were just hanging around, talking to each other in the shopping malls, because that was the fashionable thing to do for teenagers in 2006 in Sydney. And the, 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 the people in charge of Sydney, they thought of lots of different ways they wanted to change the situation. They wanted the kids just to go away. So they tried putting security guards in them, asking them to move on. And of course, the kids just ignored them. They tried, tried high-pitched noises, which is supposed to work as well, but it didn't really work. The kids just ignored that as well because it was cool to hang around in the shopping malls. Then they came up with their secret weapon and they played Barry Manilow songs. Now, Barry Manilow songs are nice for the people who like that music, who are now generally in their 50s and 60s, but it's really, really uncool. And if you make an area uncool, then the teenagers will leave it. And that's what happened. They started playing Barry Manilow's greatest hits and the teenagers just vanished within a day. So that's Barry Manilow for crowd control. Now we're gonna have a quick look at something a bit more technical. Not very technical for you guys because you're all quantum physicists and nothing's too difficult for you. Um, but there's some interesting stuff about musical scales and particularly why the octave is so special. Because the octave is a cornerstone of all musical systems all over the world. The octave is the thing that people start with. Cavemen started with it, you know, it goes back hundreds of thousands of years. So why is it so special? It's, it's only, a, I mean, everyone will tell you that uh, if you play a note and then play a note an octave above, the above note is twice the frequency of the lower note, which is obviously, you know, important, but it, why is it so very important? Let's look at different notes from different instruments. Here we've got the, the wave front given out by a flute and over and a violin. And you can see that the, these notes are all the same pitch. They've all got the same uh, cyclic uh, uh, time, cycle time. Uh, and the flute goes, it's a big mountain and a small mountain into a valley. And then you've got big mountain, small mountain into a valley. And that just repeats. And that's the repeating um, signal we're getting from a flute. It's very pure. It's very, it's very uncomplicated. <clears throat> An oboe is much more complicated. You've got mountain, mountain, double mountain, 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 double mountain, <clears throat> and so on. And a violin is also very complicated. The thing is that if you're producing a musical note, it doesn't matter what uh, wave front or wave pattern you use, so long as it repeats between 20 and 20,000 times a second. You could slam a door and then take a recording of that, make it a few milliseconds long and repeat it 110 times a second and it will sound like uh, musical note A. It doesn't matter what signal you use. 
So any repeating pattern of pressure uh, that any pattern at all that repeats more than 20 times a second and less than 20,000 times a second, you'll hear as a musical note. So we're going to be talking about octaves and to make it simple, we're going to use a sine wave like this. And we will just use a single wave because it's easy to talk about that. Obviously that would never happen in real life, but we're talking scientifically here. So let's just talk about a single wave. So when you play an octave, the, the, the F note at the top here, it's not the no F, it's the frequency is, is F. You have a single curve, a, sign, a single iteration of the, of the sine curve. And that's what you get for your single iteration. If you play 2F, then you have exactly the same... Uh, um, exactly the same time for the, for the note. Uh, but you've got, you've got two waves. You go over it twice. And when you add them together, you get this little thing here. Now, the thing is that 2F and F together have the same frequency as F. They repeat with the same frequency as F. So um, your brain can choose whether to, to identify this as two notes to playing together or one note with a different timbre. And it's the only way, it's the only combination that this happens with. It doesn't happen with any other two notes at all. Just one note and the note an octave above it. Your brain is confused into thinking, is this actually two notes? Or is it just that same note I heard in the first place with a different timbre? And that's why octaves are so very special. And obviously the cavemen and so on who started using musical systems didn't realize this was the case, but they would have heard this very close consonance between a note and any note an octave above. Basically, the lower note can eat the upper note and make it into a note of its own. But then we have to produce scales. Uh, all musical systems use scales. They generally divide the octave up into approximately 12 uh, little packets, and then they choose some of them to be in keys. That's what happens in all Western music. You have actually got 13 notes in your octave, and you choose about seven of them to be in your uh, in your key. But how do you choose the frequencies? How do you choose the the, um, the cycle times? Well, one good thing we know we know octaves work very well together. So we've got the lowest note and the highest note. Uh, and if you play um, one and a half times the frequency or two thirds the cycle time, which is the same thing. You, do, you get a, a nice repeating pattern. You can see these patterns are very pleasant because, because they look pleasant. And sure enough, that really does work nicely. Uh, and Pythagoras developed a system where you took a basic frequency and then you had the one and a half times that frequency. And then you had one and a half times that frequency, but that made the third note outside the octave. So you had to bring it back down an octave and so on. And using just one and a half times the frequency, or you can call it two thirds of cycle time, you can produce a whole array of notes and you do get 12 to the octave. So you had cycle time of one for the first one, then two thirds of cycle time, then two thirds of two thirds of the cycle time, but that takes it above the octave. So you have to multiply by two and bring it back down to this. And then two thirds of two thirds of two thirds times two and so on. And you go through the whole system like that and you can produce yourself a scale with 12 notes in it. But there's a problem. If you do this on the 12th iteration, the cycle time you get is 0.493. And it should be 0.5 to get an octave because the cycle time of the note and octave above your original note should be 0.5. So here we have a problem. The octave note, if you do it by this system, is wrong. It's the wrong frequency and it sounds wrong. Uh, the, the, the problem, the difference between the 0.49 and the 0.5 is called the Pythagorean comma. And Everyone was very disappointed when it didn't work out that way because it should, you know, Pythagoras was very keen on numbers and he wanted the whole thing to work out. He thought this is how the world worked, but it doesn't. So the Pythagorean system just simply doesn't work. So now we move to the just scale, which should work. Uh, and here we choose uh, cycle times. Uh, we've got one cycle time here. We've got half of the, pre of the octave. Um, Two thirds we've just been looking at. And obviously three quarters would be good as well. And we're getting a nice pattern of steps here. 
And if you carry on this logic, then you do this and you get what's called the just scale, which works very well with very nice consonances between these notes played together. Uh, basically, the, the thing we're trying to achieve here is a system, a system where lots of different notes can be played together as harmonies and give you good combinations because all Western music depends on harmonies. You know, we all use uh, chords on pianos, chords on guitars, and uh, most not, well, a lot of non-Western music doesn't do that. It uses drones and much, uh, much freer interpretation of the, uh, of the melody notes. But you can't be free with your melody notes if you want to have chords, because the, the notes must fit the chords. So what we're trying for here is a system whereby everything works nicely together. So that's a good system there. But there's a problem with the just scale. If you have cycle times like this, that's great. But if you want to change key, then perhaps you will now want to start playing a different tune, starting with your eight over nine cycle time. And if you do that, then the other fractions, and you, and you use, so we're now making eight over nine one. So eight over nine times three fifths should be one of these fractions here. And it doesn't work out like that. Basically, if you start on a different note, your fractions give you different frequencies. So there's a problem there. The only way the just scale works is if you're using instruments which can all slide up and down a bit on their frequencies. So choirs can use just scales. Um, trombone ensembles or string quintets can, uh, string quartets can all use uh, just scales because they can adjust the frequency of individual notes because a C sharp in the first part of the piece of music won't be the same as a C sharp in the second part of the piece of music if it's changed key. So, but if you've got a keyboard, it's no good because you can't manipulate the, the frequencies on a keyboard. So what we did, we came up with the equal temperament, which is to divide these 12 equal steps equally. So to get the next note's frequency, you multiply the note you've got by the 12th root of two. So basically you add about 6% to its frequency. And here you can see the notes, the just scale frequencies and the equal temperament frequencies and the differences here. The differences aren't big enough for us to make a problem out of it. Basically, uh, the differences are fairly small. There is a bit of a problem in that major thirds don't sound quite as smooth as they do in the just scale, but, uh, but the big advantage is you can move from key to key. You can start playing in E major and move to B major, and it doesn't mean you have to have different frequencies for your notes. Right, moving on to the, the final bit of my uh, talk here. I think it's the final bit, yeah. Why does music exist? And by the way, just at the end of my talk, I've, I've got, I know that quite a lot of the listeners at the moment are doing PhDs and they have to do monograph PhDs. Uh, I've been a PhD tutor for many years and I have a trick which helps some people do monograph PhDs. It only takes two minutes to explain. So I'll do that at the end of my talk before we do any questions. But let's go back to this, this talk. Why does music exist? So music goes back a long, long way. Um, and this is the earliest musical instrument found so far. It's a 30,000 year old flute made out of the bone from a condor. And uh, it has holes drilled in it. The holes have been very carefully made. And if you blow into it, you can actually play tunes. It, this is actually the pentatonic scale that we still use. Um, it's the star, you can play things like the Star Spangled Banner on this thing. So this is a usable 30,000 year old flute. So it's obvious that um, music goes back a long way in history and it's everywhere all over the world. Now Darwin quite sensibly said that, uh, he said that if anything is very, very old and is everywhere, it must have something to do with survival, which is strange when you think about music. How can music have anything to do with survival? Darwin's best guess at the time that um, was that it was all to do with sexual display. Music was a method of human sexual display, uh, like this Robin here who is shouting that he's a big chap who'll make a lovely husband and everyone else can stay away. But it's not actually true, is it? Well, it's partially true. There is some element of sexual display to do with musicians. This is a, an experiment which took place in France. Uh, some psychologists set up a, um, an experiment whereby they got a 20-year-old good-looking male actor 
uh, and they asked him to basically ask girls out. Uh, the idea was he'd be getting out of his car as a girl came along and he would talk to the girl and say, this, you know, you couldn't do this nowadays, but this, this is in France about 25 years ago. He'd get out of his car and say, you're very pretty. I'm going to work now, but could I have your phone number so I can phone you up later to go for a drink? And he did, he did this to 300 young women and he was filmed doing it. And in 100 cases, he was empty handed. He was just getting out of his car. In 100 cases, he had a guitar case in his hand. And in 100 cases, he had a gym bag in his hand. So that's 300 young women. Uh, one of them, they were all given the same chat up line. And uh, one, uh, 100 was empty handed, 100 guitar case, and 100 had the gym bag. So when he was empty handed, one young woman in six gave their phone number over. So don't forget, this is a very good looking young actor. So they, you know, there was some interest there. When he had a guitar case in his hand, the, the numbers went up, doubled. So he, one in three of the young women gave the phone number over. And when he was carrying a gym bag, the number dropped to one in 10. So going back to what Darwin was saying, is this because uh, musicians are considered to be successful? Well, we know that uh, musicians generally aren't successful. Generally, it's a hobby. And if, it, if it's not a hobby, then you're not earning very much. So it's not really a status symbol for success being a musician. But musicians are considered to be fun and cool. And that's probably why he got increased activity uh, when he had a, a guitar case in his hand. But when we look at real human beings having fun and uh, trying to interact, uh, this is a, a typical student party and uh, you, they haven't changed much since my day. And all these people here are interested in finding partners, but there are no tambourines or tu tubers in the picture here. Nobody is displaying any sort of musical uh, prowess because that's not what we do. So I think we can say that Darwin was wrong. Uh, there's no great musical uh, display aspect to music in general. So what is it? Why is music Darwinian? Well, going back to our uh, comments earlier on about the uh, your inner pharmacy, oxytocin is a very important drug we generate into our system uh, when we're breastfeeding, when we're having sex, and when we are nurturing babies and so breastfeeding, yeah, uh, and um, also when we're singing together. It's, it's well known, you can do blood tests on people and see the oxytocin entering their system as they sing together. So this is a bit unusual when you first start thinking about it, but you can imagine um, this group here have been singing together and I think they're all Welsh rugby fans. And later on, they'll all be going home in their various coaches and stuff. And you can guarantee that if they've been singing together, they will look after each other more than if they haven't. So they'll make sure that everyone gets on the bus to go home. Um, nowadays, this is a fairly trivial thing. But 100,000 years ago, hunter-gatherer groups, if they were bonded together better, they would live longer. They would survive better. It, for predators or enemies, they have a better chance of survival. So having something like singing together which generates oxytocin, and oxytocin is your bonding chemical, basically you're gonna survive longer. There's a, there's a leftover part of this nowadays. Uh, soldiers actually sing together quite a lot. Uh, American uh, Marines, when they're marching, sing together, and it bonds them together really well. Uh, it also improves their marching rhythm and reduces the boredom of, of marching. So it's still useful in life and death situations today, but basically, if you sing together, you generate oxytocin, it makes you into a better group. And music is also a nurturing tool. Uh, mothers use a number of musical techniques to bond and calm down their babies. Lullabies and play songs are obviously music, but mothers are also talking motherese, like, who's a pretty boy then? And uh, it's a very sing-songy way of talking, and babies love it. So. The thing about human babies is, well, this here's a baby zebra. Uh, within about an hour of being born, it's a master of predator evasion. It really is very good at getting away from any sort of danger. Human babies, not so good. 
Now, from a prejudice point of view, this baby is a tasty snack. Human babies take a long time to mature. Uh, they're not very good at uh, looking after their emotions. They're not looking after themselves. So, and with apes, the baby clings to the mum, which is fine. But we're not covered in hair, so the baby can't cling to mum. And mum needs to, or dad needs to have their hands free to do things like cooking and lighting fires. I'm going back now a hundred thousand years. And so, if you want to uh, reassure your baby that you're there and keep it calm, a human baby. Singing is a really good non-contact non -contact method of calming and reassuring babies because we can't have our babies clinging to our fur as we haven't got any. So Darwinian music, reasons why music exists, it bonds groups of people and helps the nurturing of infants. And they're both very important points. So just to wrap up, why do we love music? It helps us bond with children. It helps us bond together. It gives us enormous range of emotions and helps to uh, modify our internal chemistry to make things better for ourselves. So why wouldn't we love it? So that's the end of my talk on music. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, and I hope you go out and buy my books. Uh, I will, oh, now it's gone black, hang on. I'll go back to that one. Okay, so that's the end of that talk. Um, while you're all listening, uh, the people amongst you who are PhDs, we'll have some questions in a moment, if you're happy with that. Um, just before you have questions, I've got one two minute thing to say. If you're writing a monograph, all your tutors will tell you the first thing I'm going to say next, but they won't say the last bit. And the last bit is the bit that makes it easier. And I've discovered this with my own students and I've given it to many friends who've done PhDs and that some of them have found it very helpful. Some people don't find it helpful at all, but hopefully, half a dozen of you will find this helpful. So what you do in your final year, you know approximately what your PhD is going to look like. You go and get a couple of old ones that are the same sort of size and you imagine the PhD as a document, a single book. Then what you do is, everyone will tell you to do this, you write down the chapter titles of your own PhD and then you write the sub-chapter titles and then the sub-sub-chapter titles and the sub-sub-sub-chapter titles. You get the whole thing lined up. Everybody will tell you to do that. But the trick at the end is put the page numbers in now. This is a very odd thing to say, but basically, if you know that chapter four is going to be 30 pages long, then it means that section 4.13 can't be longer than two pages. Because you have to imagine, you know, physically how big this thing is going to be. And if section 4.133 can only be about a page long, you can do it today. And so it really does break down the thing, in not only in smaller pieces, which is what the whole titling does, it breaks it down into pieces that you know how big they are. And that can really help you when you're doing a PhD. So hopefully that will help some of you. And um, now we can have some questions and I will stop sharing my screen. And right, so yeah, there's quite a lot of information there. I hope you enjoyed it.